I have a good woman. I ain't good looking. But I do some cooking. I'm the old fat guy. So use that oven if you want some loving. Be like the old fat guy. Like the old fat guy. Welcome to another episode of You Can Make It with David Farrell. Today I'm going to do something kind of special. It's called buckboard bacon, and I'm going to put a bit of maple flavor in it, so this will be maple buckboard bacon. Now, what buckboard bacon is, is bacon made out of of a pork shoulder or pork butt. It's leaner than the normal belly bacon we buy in the stores, and it's fattier than back bacon or Canadian bacon made from the loin. It's kind of in between, and I kind of like that about it. You can just buy a boned roast and unroll it and use that to make it, or you can buy, like I have here, a whole pork shoulder or a pork butt. If you buy the whole one, though, you have to take care of some things on the meat. There is skin on the meat that you have to take off, and there's a bone that you have to take out. So what we're going to do first is take the skin off. And we're going to do that by just going to a corner of the skin and very carefully cutting underneath it. And then we're just going to fold it back and use a real sharp knife to slowly work our way through that fat and skin layer. Just keep peeling it back. I like to do it in strips like this because it's easier. Just keep slicing that sharp knife along. Now occasionally we'll get like I did there where the skin goes on under the knife and you don't cut it, but we'll just take care of that in a moment. So let's cut off that little piece of skin that didn't get cut off when we were going through. Now I'm just going to keep doing that until I've got all the skin off of the shoulder. And there we go, the skin is all off of it. Now there's bones that you can see that run through from there right through to the other side. I personally find it easiest to take the bone out by starting with a slice down the fat side to the bone. So we'll just slice right down to the bone. Just like that. Now, there's the bone there. So now we need a little bit narrower knife. And we're going to try and cut along the bone. And just cut around it. You'll see that there's a bit of a T-shape to it here. It makes it a little harder, so we'll just keep working our way around that bone. And So now you've got all the bone out, you've got the skin off, and you've got some chunks of meat here. Now the thing about making 
buckboard bacon or any kind of bacon is you don't want your meat to be thicker than three inches thick because that takes too long for the cure to go through it when you're dry curing, which is my preferred method. So we've got to cut this into pieces, so I'm just going to start by cutting it there. I like it not much more than six inches long either because that doesn't fit into my slicer so well. So there's one piece that I can cure into bacon. Now I've got this big thick piece up here, so let's start by cutting it in half. And that's two more pieces I can do. And as you can see, they're just about three inches thick each, so I don't have to do anything more with those. So I've got three pieces of pork cut up, the uh, skin off and the bone off, and I'm ready to start putting my bacon in the cure. So I'm just going to take a break now and set up my curing station. I've set up my curing station, which is just a spot that I can work to put some dry cure onto the pork to make the bacon. Now, the magic ingredient of dry cure is something called prog powder number one, or pink salt number one, or instacure number one. There's a bunch of different names for it. But what they all are is a mixture of 93.75% salt and 6.25% nitrates. And what the nitrates do is give the bacon the nice pink color and the taste we're familiar with bacon, but it also acts as a preservative. So when we slow smoke the pork for a long period of time, it doesn't go bad because it's got nitrates in it. Unfortunately, if you put too much nitrates in, they're bad for you. A lot of nitrates are unhealthy, so it's very important you stick exactly to the amount of nitrates or pink salt in the recipe. I like to weigh my pink salt because it's much more accurate, but there's a rule. For every kilogram of pork to make maple bacon, you need three grams of pink salt, or that's about two milliliters, but like I say, I prefer you weigh it. You also need 15 milliliters of brown sugar and 15 milliliters of salt. We'll also be injecting 25 milliliters of maple syrup into the meat. Now it's critical that if you have half as much meat, you use half of each of those ingredients. If you have twice as much, you use double. If you use pounds, for every pound of uh, pork you have, you'd use 0 0.05 ounces of uh, pink salt, which is about one-fifth of a teaspoon. You'd use one and a quarter teaspoon of brown sugar and one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt, and you'll be using about 12 milliliters of maple syrup to inject for each pound. So what I've done is I've used this little scale just to weigh exactly three grams of my pink salt. I've put in the 15 milliliters of brown sugar and the 15 milliliters of kosher salt, and I'm just going to mix them together now. Now, you'll note that I've put the meat on a plate. That's very important because you want to make sure you get as much of this cure into the bag I'm going to use in a moment as possible. So what we're going to do is just leave that mixed and I'm going to inject my pork. So what I'm going to do is just put 25 milliliters of uh, maple syrup into an injection needle. There's a measure on here so I can get 25 milliliters exactly. There we go. And then I'm going to start injecting that into the meat. Just every inch or so. Give it a little bit more. This is just to really kick up the maple flavor in your pork. Don't worry, it will spread through it, so you don't have to be worried about being too exact. This is just to get it into the meat now. And we'll just put the last of it in right there. So, 
Now I've got the maple syrup into the pork. I'm going to take my curing mixture and I'm going to sprinkle half of it over the pork and just rub it in. Get it all nicely coated and flip the meat over and put the other half on and rub it all in. Try to get it evenly spread over all the surfaces. Now you're always going to end up with some on the plate, it's just the way it is, but that's why we use the plate, is to make sure we get all of the curing mix into this bag. Now what I've done is I've taken a Ziploc bag and sealed one end, uh, but with your vacuum sealer, I'm going to be putting the meat in here and sealing the other end without sucking the air because I want to be able to massage it and move it around. So just open up the bag. I like to kind of flip it over like a cuff because then you get less schmuck and stuff on the top of the bag when you go to seal it again. And put your meat in the bag. Now, a critical part is to get all of this stuff off of the plate and into the bag. So make sure you scrape it down as much as you possibly can just to get everything into the bag. You're not going to get 100% but get as much as you possibly can. There we go. Now I'm just going to wash my hands, so give me a second. I've got the meat in the bag now and I'm just going to seal it and not suck the air out. That's so I can massage it and move it around in the bag. Now the bag's then going to go in the fridge. How long it stays in the fridge depends on how thick the meat is. I like to give three uh, days for each inch of thickness of the meat. This is three inches thick, so I'd like to keep it in here nine days. You can keep it in for 10 if you want to be really sure. Then you want to massage it every day or so just to turn it over and make sure that all of the cure gets to coat around it. You'll note that some liquid comes out at the beginning and then disappears back into the meat. That's perfectly normal. So I'm just going to seal this, put it in the fridge, and I'll see you in nine days. Welcome back. 12 days have actually gone by instead of the 9 or 10 I normally do. It's fine for up to two weeks in the cure, so I just had a lot of stuff happening and got busy, so I took a bit longer. So I have my three pieces of meat. You notice I did each one in its own little curing bag. That's because it just comes out better than if you try and put multiple pieces in one bag. So now we just want to take the surface salt off of each of the pieces of pork. So we'll just cut our bag open. And we'll start by rinsing the pork under some water. You'll note that the pork feels firmer than it did when you put it in. That's because the curing salt sucks a lot of the liquid out and makes it firm up. So just rinse it off a bit. And we'll do this with each of the other two pieces of pork. Once I've rinsed the surface salt off under running water, I'm going to soak these for an hour in cold water. I'm going to soak them for an hour in cold water, but I will change the water once in that period of time just to get some of the excess salt out. All the pieces of meat are submerged. This will just sit and soak for an hour now. The pork's been sitting in water soaking for an hour and I did change the water once. And now I've drained the water off and what we're going to do is take the pork out and put it on a tray and just dab as much excess water off of it as you can. What we're trying to do is get the surface of the pork dry because when we're going to smoke it, you'll find that the smoke flavor is a lot better and a lot nicer if the surface of the pork is dry when it goes in. So we'll just dry each of the pieces off. Now, the drying with the paper towel won't be enough. You need it really quite dry so it feels tacky. 
People who make bacon call that pellicle. It's a dry surface. So in addition to drying the pork off, what we're going to do is put it in the fridge uncovered overnight because that tends to dry it out too. You can also put it in a 140 degree oven for an hour to dry it out or 150 degree would be okay or you can put it on a rack in front of a fan for a few hours to dry it off. The critical thing is you want the surface of the pork to be totally dry. So I'm just going to give that a dry off first, that'll give it a head start, and I'm going to do it by putting it in the fridge overnight, because I find that does the best job. So this will go in the fridge, and I'll see you again tomorrow. My bacon was in the freezer overnight, and it got nice and dry in that tacky surface that I called pellicle. If there's any damp spots on it, make sure you pat them down with a paper towel and get them really nice and dry. I've preheated my pellet smoker to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, but I like a little bit of extra smoke on the bacon, so I'm going to be using something called the Amazing Tube Smoker. Just let me show you how I light that up. You can see that the Amazing Tube Smoker is just a perforated tube with some pellets in it that I ignite with a propane torch. You want to give it a good 30 seconds, let it burn for a minute, then give it another good 30 seconds. And then just let it burn for another minute before you put it into your smoker. It just adds an additional layer of smoke. I'm just going to put the pellet smoker into the smoker. You can see how it gives off a good bit of smoke. That'll settle down a bit as it goes on. And then I'm going to put my cured pork in there. There we go, I've got the pork into the smoker with the pellet smoker. Now, I'm just going to put my probe into the thickest part of one of the pieces of meat so I can keep track of the weight, with the heat rather, the temperature, without having to open the lid. Once I've got it put in, I'll just shut her up and I'm going to cook it to between 130, 40, excuse me, between 130 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. I had the bacon out in the smoker at 180 degrees for about four hours to get it to an internal temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit. You're not trying to cook the bacon, you're just trying to get it to the point where it's set and easy to slice. So any place between 130 degrees and 140 degrees Fahrenheit is fine. You're going to be cooking it anyway when you fry it up. You don't have to do this in a smoker. If you don't have a smoker, you could do it in a 180 degree Fahrenheit oven. It just won't have that fine smoke taste. Now, some European countries don't smoke their bacon, and they make a very good bacon. So give it a try if you don't have a smoker in your oven. You'll notice, though, that the smoke gives it a nice, deep red color. It's really a beautiful color, and the scent, I wish you could smell it. So now that it's come in from the smoker, I just let it cool. Then I'm going to cover it with plastic wrap and put it in the fridge overnight to allow the smoke to set into the meat. So, I'll see you tomorrow. I let my bacon sit in the fridge overnight to chill up and set up some firmness and it's definitely a little bit harder. Now comes the time to slice it. Now if you don't have a fancy slicer, you can cut your meat with a knife. I find that if I use a uh, specially made slicing knife like this, it works really well. It's ultra sharp, it's got a straight edge, and it tends to cut straight up and down without curling each way. So you can just take your bacon and slice it to any thickness you want. Now I would encourage you to slice it a bit thicker than the store-bought bacon. What you're going to find is the store-bought bacon cuts it so thin because they want to sell you more slices to look like you're getting more. If you cut it just a little bit less than an eighth of an inch thick, I think it's about perfect. Now these end pieces that are small, save them for making chili and that sort of stuff. Just fry them up before you put your chili in and they're absolutely delicious. And check out the great color of that bacon. It's just perfect. 
it looks so pretty. And you can just go ahead and slice the whole thing. Of course, this will take a lot longer than a mechanical slicer. And I just happen to have a mechanical slicer. So I'll get it out and we'll show you how it works. Give me a moment. So here I have my slicer all set up. And I've put the meat on the tray. And make sure you use the handle and don't get your finger any place near that rotating blade. And we'll just turn it on. And we'll take some slices. If you don't want a piece of this bacon, you are just crazy. Now something I've learned with my slicer over the years is, if I turn it over once in a while, I get better, more even slices. So I'll just continue slicing up the meat, but you have to admit it looks awfully pretty. And then, of course, we'll fry some up. Give me some time. I've sliced all my bacon up and I'm just going to freeze it in vacuum seal bags and put it in the freezer. It's good for months like that. I'll leave one package out for now, but you can't make all this bacon without trying some. So, of course, we're going to fry some up. I've preheated a frying pan up to medium high and I'll just put some slices of our newly made bacon. I'll listen to that sizzle into the pan. You'll note that it doesn't give off a whole bunch of water like commercial bacon. The way they get the cure in most commercial bacons is they inject a solution into it. This has been dry cured and it just won't throw as much water and as a result it will also cook just a bit faster. Okay, the bacon's been cooking for about five minutes and it's getting close to the way like it was just, just before it's crisp, just starting to get some color in the fat portions. One of the things you'll notice that this bacon does give off a little bit of fat, but not nearly as much as the regular sliced bacon you get, but more than back bacon, so it's sort of in between in fat content. So you can cook it, like I say, as crisp as you want. This one here is just not quite crisp, but it's just got a bit of bite to it now. So that's the way I like it. So let's take a piece, throw it on a plate, and give it a try. Mm. The first thing you'll notice that while it has the nice salty bacon taste, it isn't as salty as the commercial stuff because I like less salt in mine. So I've worked the recipe down so it has the least amount of salt possible to still get a good cure. If you like your saltier, just add a bit more salt to the recipe than I use. The other thing you'll notice is this has a real background sweetness. It's the maple. You can taste the maple, it's there, but if you've bought maple bacon in the store, this won't taste like it. They use artificial flavors. This is the real maple sugar taste. A nice sweetness that just hangs around on your tongue after you eat it. If you ate it compared to bacon without the maple in it, you'd immediately notice the difference. So this is real maple bacon, not the maple bacon they have in the stores. So as you can see, making bacon takes a long time, but all the steps are quite easy, and if you just do them one at a time, you can make great maple buckboard bacon. So, make some bacon, eat some bacon, and remember that you can make it. When dinner time gets in, and your wife has made it clear, it's your turn to cook, my dear. You have no need to fear. Make a dinner, feed your spouse, bring peace into your house, you can make it. If you're lucky, she will say, and life will be okay, life will be okay, you can make it.